Hey, everybody. Welcome to Before College TV Live. Today, I am here with three students from the University of Florida. These are first-generation students, and they're leaders, and they're so fascinating. Panelists, welcome to Before College TV. How are you all? Great. Good. Thanks for having us. Uh, this is good. This is good. Daniel and I had a chance to get to know each other the other day. Uh, Daniel, uh, so explain to me, what is your leadership role on campus? I have multiple leadership roles on campus, but I think the one that pertains, the, the two that pertain the most to um, being first generation is that I am the cabinet director for first generation affairs, which is a part of a student government executive um, cabinet. And I'm also the founder and executive director of a first generation leadership program, um, which we're actually starting this year and everyone on this call is on the executive board for that as well. That's exciting. So for anybody who's a first gen student and as a first gen student, how would you uh, qualify to be a first gen student, Daniel? Like how would you qualify to be a first gen student? Yeah, uh, like what does that mean? Program? For, people, for people who aren't familiar with the term first generation student. Yeah, so um, I think first generation student can mean a couple things. Um, one of them is just being a first generation student, college student, for example, like your family um, has never been to college. But I think that also for, and I think it's the case for a lot of immigrant children like myself, is that we had parents that maybe went to college in another country, but in which that educational system was very unlike that one here. Um, and they just weren't able to help you through that process here. So that makes you, in a sense, a first-generation college American student in that sense. Um, so those are kind of two definitions that are always like, that always play around in my head yeah. because I don't think there's one specific definition that can fit every first-generation student. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's helpful for people who are from another country whose parents have a college education and they're coming here, they can still be part of the organization and you're not going to reject them. You're going to be like, come on in. You're welcome to be here. Right. So, so Mambo and Gabby and Daniel, you all know each other and you know each other because you are part of this first generation group. Uh, when did you first get to meet each other? Where did you have your first interaction? Mambo, you can go first if you'd like. <laughs> okay. Um, we met each other, at least I met um, Gabby and the rest of the board um, on a Zoom call. We kind of all, Daniel created um, a group chat, like, hey, this is like everybody you're working with, and we we're all talking, getting excited. Um, and then we got to see each other's faces for the first time on a Zoom call, I would say like two, three weeks ago, and it was honestly ecstatic because everyone was excited. We were all talking and jittering, so it was an amazing opportunity to meet everyone. So you've not met face to face? No. No, sir. Wow. This is great because especially during this year, the year of COVID, the fact that you three have a friendship, right? Would you call it a friendship? Yeah. Can I call it that? Can we label yeah. it a friendship? Absolutely. Great. You've made friends and you've never met before because you've been doing Zoom calls, right? Yeah. And Daniel, you started an organization, you started a movement, you started this new group through Zoom. Basically, yeah, yeah, I definitely happened during quarantine, yeah. Right, you just started a quarantine leadership group, which <laughs> says that you can do anything that you all want to do, even during COVID, and you're all going to get together, you're going to be on campus, and you're going to do this, right? You're going to get to see each other, right? That's going to yeah. be exciting. Will you live stream the meeting when you all finally meet together for the first time? Yes, that's actually one of the things that we're working on is um, <laughs> live streaming those on Facebook and also pre-recording them so we can also upload them to our social nice. media. I actually want to live stream when you see each other like walking down the hall. Like I want a Facebook live of like Mambo and it's like Gabby and Dan Daniel. Okay. All right. So anyway, let's get to know you because I want everybody who's watching to be able to get a sense of just who are you? How could someone identify with you? So we know how you know each other, but Mambo, tell me about you. Tell me about high school you. What were you like? What were your family dynamics like? So if there's someone watching, they can be like, I, t I get it. So let us know about your life. I have been raised in a single parent household. It's just been my mom and my sister who is younger than me. She is now 16, I'm 18. Um, and basically 
she, um, since she's from Cameroon, um, she basically had to do like everything herself, like make sure her daughters were like out there doing things that she was, had to have an opportunity to do for herself when she was younger um, or things that she aspired to do. So she put herself in so many, just, she's honestly amazing. I mean, if you ever meet her, you know, you have been blessed. More, like give me specific <laughs> examples of just how awesome your My mom. mom? Yeah, okay. like, like, like just, yeah, give me details. <sighs> wow, okay. Um, so for example, imagine like, let's talk like just younger me. I'm super excited because um, I thought my dad was going to come to my dance recital, right? Um, and this is like someone that like doesn't, we don't have like the best of bonds. Um, but he didn't come. It was just like my mom and a couple of um, family members. And so even though it was kind of like heartbreaking for me because I was like, oh, you're like, oh, he was supposed to like show up. Um, she was there. Um, and that's been just like a testament for her, like throughout my entire life. She's always been there. Um, like golf tournaments, when people, when I've been faced with times of just people not like, really accepting me for who I am um, as an African-American woman. Um, she's been saying like, hey, don't listen to them. You are so much better than that. And that's been just something that really pushed me through. Um, in high school, I was very, very heavily involved. I was doing everything, um, especially trying to make sure that my grades are up because, you know, immigrant parents, they really want to see their kids succeed. Um, you better have straight A's, have like the best of grades, be on top of your class. Cause like, if you can't, then like, why you're going to let someone know? <laughs> um, so that's just like something that really pushed me in high school. And that's just a little background. On yeah, me. that's great. And you were on the, you were a golfer in, in high school and I know you golf now. And at the University of Florida, right? You're yes, still a, a, a great golfer. <laughs> yes, I, I think so. I can always improve, but yes, sir. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm curious. I know golfing tends to be uh, less of a diverse sport. Would you say that's accurate? <laughs> very accurate. So it's a way of like soft shoeing around, you know, being very gentle with that. So I want to know, you know, another piece of this journey that you're all on is doing things that maybe not everybody else has done or dealing with the challenges, the, the rejection. I'm obsessed with rejection, Mambo, um, especially when it comes to this idea that you could be rejected before you even speak. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be rejected because of your gender, because of your race, because of your country of origin. And then being in a sport where you look different and you mentioned that your mom has always been there, was that ever something that came up in high school? I wouldn't say, um, I had some troubling times with golf in high school. Um, one example was like me coming out, like, you know, I'm on a good golf team. Um, and I was ready to go play. I was practicing and I was stepping up to like head over to the tee. So I went up to someone, I was like, Hey, um, can you like put me to where like the first hole is? Cause I, this is a new course. Um, they looked at me and they were like, Oh no, you're supposed to be volunteering. Um, the outfits are back there going change. And I, <laughs> I literally just like said, like, I'm, I'm, I have a golf bag on, What like, I can't think of anything other than like the fact that I'm African-American or, you know, I'm younger. I literally, I can't, um, <laughs> just like, so the fact that someone would think that I'm volunteering or I'm here to help yeah. um, was something that I really, that was one example back in high school that was like, yeah. not the best. <laughs> yeah, but, there's yeah. more of those that come up in college, just, um, you know, being who you all are, uh, you know, you're exceptional and you deal with a lot of pushback, especially as leaders. Um, I'd love to hear those stories because um, I think they just make your journey so much even more powerful and relatable because you're who you are. And just also, you're all first generation students. I have so much respect for you and what you do and the path that you pave because there are so many other people who have so much support. And I feel like you guys are just, you're just amazing doing what you do. Uh, Gabby, give me a sense of you, your high school you, Gabby. Well, high school me was not like anything like I am today. In and in, um, in a good way, I guess you can say, I was you know fairly involved. Did good in school, immigrant parents, speak for itself. It was always good grades, grades over everything. Um, I was very, very social. So I was going out a lot, you know, having time with my friends. And I'm very family oriented, so it was a lot of time with them. So it was like a good balance of everything. Um, I went to a predominantly Hispanic high school. Uh-huh. So every, there was no, the racial diversity was in the sense of where you were, what country you were from. Okay. or what part of Latin America you were from. It wasn't more of a difference of races. It was a more of what part of Latin America are you from? So there was no, there wouldn't be any culture shock when I go to school or anything like that. Right. And that's kind of like more of why 
I take on like being um, Cuban American now more than ever because I see how important it is and you know owning up to where you've come from and where you like where you've been uh -huh. and how it contributes to who you are I think is a really big part so from high school me to now is a little so it's very different but it's in a good way yeah was college something that was always going to be in your future I want to say yes um, but if we're being honest, I genuinely didn't know because school isn't for everybody. And I thought that I wanted to do other things rather than actually pursue an education. And when I got, uh, when I got accepted, I knew automatically that I was going to go. It was my dreams. It's my, it is my dream school. Um, my you older sister. Had, dream school? Yeah. Yeah. My older sister, had, uh, um, she just graduated. So it was kind of like following in her footsteps and I have a younger sister too. Okay. So you had your older sister who had gone to college. So that really helped make it a little easier for you. And then going to UF was always there and you got in great. And I want to hear about the application process for all of you. So that if there are other students who are going through this, they can understand just some of those challenges. Uh, Daniel, let me know a little bit about your family, your high school background, and um, you know, let us know who you are. Oh God, <laughs> that's that's a lot to uncover there. Um, my family, I think, has always been the backbone of who I am, and I think more specifically, my mom. Um, on top of anyone, um, I really resonated with what Mambo said that, you know, I grew up in a single in a in a in a in a sing like in a household that it was only my mom. Uh -huh. um, my grandma also lived with us, so she helped out a lot. Um, but when my mom came to this country, she came to this country without anything. Um, she had to work three jobs when I was during our first year or two that we were here. Um, and even after that, she had to continue working two jobs. And to this day, she still works two jobs um, just to support me and to support me in, any, in everything that I do. Um, never have I ever asked my mom something that she said no to. Her answer is always, we're going to make it happen. We're going to make it work. Um, and that is something that I think I've always carried with me, you know, that there's nothing impossible in life. If my mom, a single parent who left, um, a country that really no one could leave because you were restricted from leaving, got me to this country for me to have a better future. Um, what I'm doing now is very minimal to the struggles and the challenges that she went through. So my, my time in high school was very much characterized by me pushing myself to the greatest of my abilities. Um, I did, I was in a competitive swimming team in high school. So I did that for three years, uh -huh. um, since sophomore year. I, um, I was involved in National Honor Society. I was involved in the Green, the green Club on campus. Um, I was involved in, a, in, in so many things on, on campus. Um, and outside of campus, I was involved in this program called Youth Impact which was essentially a cohort of people, high school students from my county that would go and do community service um, around the county once a month in different areas. Um, and, and, you know, as, as everyone, the same as everyone in this call, you know, my, my education and my grades were always the top priority. Um, I still remember the story I always tell is I remember I called my dad um, when I got my report card because he somehow always knew when report cards came out and I'm like going down the list and he always tells me to send him a picture for, for proof. And I'm going down the list of grades and my lowest grade was a 94 in math. And I, I, I was taking all college AP or general enrollment classes. I didn't have any regular honors classes. So he looks at the 94 and he asked me, why did you get a 94? Right. <laughs> all of my other grades were like 96, 97, 98. Um, and so, so that kind of gives you some perspective of how I think rigorous my family was on me. I think my family was more rigorous on me than the educational system was. Um, and I think that on top of everything, I was more rigorous on myself. Do you have uh, siblings? I'm sorry? Do you have siblings? Yes. So I have um, two sisters, one from my dad's side, um, who recently came from Cuba three years ago. And my other sister was from my mom's side who also came with us. Um, she, she was 17 when we came here. So she ended up having to get her GED and she went to college and she's now a teacher. Wonderful. And you mentioned your dad. And I know that originally you were saying that you grew up in a single parent family. 
So what was that involvement just to understand that? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my parents assume, you know, part of their, I guess, contract of leaving the, leaving the country, leaving Cuba was that once they got here, um, they were going to get a divorce. Um, and this was something I guess that they saw coming from, from before, but they knew that their main goal was for them both to be here. Okay. Um, really to make sure that I had a better future for myself. Um, so as soon as they got here, my dad actually came a year after we came because we couldn't all come together. Um, and my parents got a divorce. So for as, much, for as long as I can remember, my parents have been divorced. Okay. It was nothing that was ever a detriment to me. Um, it was always the life I was used to. And, but I did spend most of my time with my mom. I got to see my dad on the weekends. And my dad is, you know, on that topic, my dad is an exceptional father. Um, he was always there to push me. Um, he was always there, you know, as I said, like, this 94 is unacceptable. You need to get a 95 next time. And um, right. yeah, he was, he was always that person that, that kind of pushed me further. And since he didn't go to college in Cuba at all, he, he had, uh, I, I would say, a harsher life than, than the life my mom had. I think he saw in me so much potential and 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 he always talks so highly of me sometimes um i feel like i have to live up to this pedestal that he puts me on um uh, but yeah no incredible father but i just i i say single mother household just because i spent most of my time with my mom okay so i kind of look at her as the main caregiver the main person that was always there the main person that was always there to support me and my dad also lives in miami and i live four hours away so it was it was kind of like that divide there Right. Gotcha. Uh, thanks for clearing that up. And, and thanks for being so open because, um, you know, these are very personal questions and, and I'm really grateful that you can all offer and share. So Gabby, when it came to your college application process, you had a sister who was already at University of Florida. So was it easy for you to go through the application process? Was it hard for you? Was, were there any challenges in terms of like FAFSA or grades or tell me a little bit about your process? Yeah, I mentioned that my sister is, well, had just graduated and she was there, but we didn't have a great relationship. So we weren't really on talking terms. Um, we talked occasionally, maybe like on holidays and stuff like that. Okay. Um, so it was more of, I did the whole application by myself and that's usually how I do everything. So I wasn't too mad about it or too bothered by it. So fairly, it was fairly easy, just very tedious. And I think that anybody that's, you know, applying to college, have everything on a spreadsheet, make sure everything's organized. Because when I did that, it helped so much. And, you know, with essays and stuff, a lot of people have issues with that. Um, I'm not a writer. I, I love math. So writing the essays was really hard. And I know that a lot of people struggle with writing essays and stuff like that. And I think it's really helpful to, you know, seek different resources and stuff like that, which I didn't do. So that just made it only harder on me. And that was self-sabotage in its own. But, you know, for anybody that's watching and, like, wants, you know, to know, because I know that's the first step of my younger sister is just now applying to college. You know, she has me. But um, everything that I tell her is, like, fresh in my mind at this point and it's just it's the main thing is just very tedious very yeah. tedious because every college has different ways of applying i know there's coalition um there's another one that i don't remember but common there's app. another one I'm common sorry app. yeah common app yes com yes common app and it was just different things for different colleges and it's very it's a broad spectrum and if you have everything organized it's, it's so helpful right so organizing it and then in terms of getting support in your high school of having a counselor or being part of a cohort, you didn't have that? Um, so for, for high school, I was very close with this one teacher who taught math. <laughs> and she was basically my mom because I have a very strange relationship with my mom. But, yeah. Um, What's her name? Um, Sylvia Vieja. So Sylvia was your person. Yeah, she, she's, she's amazing. But... She really helped me with, like, you know, just making sure that she was my, she was Daniel's dad. That was my equivalent. She was making sure that I did all my homework. She was making sure that I would be at school. And it came kind of like this custom of me coming to the classroom, saying, hi, hello, I'm at school, you know, going, doing homework, blah, blah, blah. And, and it was just, she was, the, she was the backbone of high school for me for all four years. Yeah. And I, I'm endlessly grateful for her, and she knows it. 
Yeah. I mean, that's so special. So she made sure that you got there and applied and you still, are you still in touch with her? Yes, absolutely. I was like, yes, right. She's totally rooting for you, um, which is great. Mambo, tell me about your college application process and where you applied. And uh, I want to know where you got in, where you didn't get in, how you landed at UF. That's a great <laughs> question. Yeah. Um, I have been very, so I've been personally very grateful for my school. Um, it is a very small school. So I really got to know, and it was six to 12. So I really got to know my teachers that were like my senior year teachers since I was like in middle school. Um, so when I got to the time of like, you know, finally applying for college, those teachers um, were, who were basically like parents as well. Um, they really sat down with us, the entire senior class we were like, hey, this is how, you, because most students were also like first generation students as well. So like, hey, this is what you're gonna do. Um, send your essays all to me. I will read them all, I will critique them. My guidance counselor was very kind to me too. And so like, I was just very, at least for me, I was very um, grateful and lucky and blessed just to have all those people kind of like in my corner and just like, you got this. And, but, <laughs> but there were times where I would be like, oh, what, what like deadlines of like colleges. I'd be like, wait, what was that again? And I kind of, Miss some, but that's totally fine <laughs> because I got to my best school anyway. Um, yeah. However, schools I didn't get into, um, I applied for Harvard because that was my dream school. That was like my number one, like Harvard or nothing. I got nothing. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's totally fine though because, um, you know, medical school, we'll, we'll try again. Um, but like I did have face those like rejections of like, oh, wait, what? Like, what's wrong with me? What? I'm pretty, yeah. I'm, I thought it was good. Um, like you've always been great, right? Like you're amazing. You're always exceptional. Is that like everyone in this call is amazing and great? Yeah, that's, I get that sense. But like you're the top of the heap. Like you're you're just so smart, and everyone wants to be you. Like is that kind of in high school? I mean, I know you don't want to say that about yourself, but like you had it together. So if anyone's going to Harvard, it would be you. Yeah, but then also <laughs> my test scores were kind of low. So that's yeah. probably something in my mind that was like, you know, freaking me out. But I mean, besides that, I was, I am Harvard material. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <totally> <laughs> <fine>. <laughs> um, yeah. But I got into basically every Florida school except for FSU because I didn't apply there because I was like, no way. Okay. Um, but if you're a null, that's totally fine. Um, but then I applied to New York. Um, I applied basically anywhere across the country because I just wanted to go somewhere that I can be able to just expand my experience. Yeah. Did you get into those other schools, all those other schools, or were there more um, rejections? Yes. Um, I basically, I got into almost every single school except for Harvard. I was waitlisted for NYU, um, and then I didn't get accepted because it was just pushing back so long. Uh -huh. um, and then I didn't get accepted to, what was it, I think, Penn State. Um, yeah. 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 That's then when it came to making your decision, of course, we you know University of Florida is amazing. Uh, but what was the deciding factor for you? Uh, was it money? Was it the school? Help me out there. Money. <laughs> it was money. definitely right. money. <laughs> right. So they gave you a lot of money. Um, it was the cheapest school um, of all the options. <laughs> yeah, but I was able to figure out a way. So. Did you get scholarships, or did you take out some loans, or how were you able to pay for it? Um, I was able to have multiple scholarships, um, and that is what is pushing me through school right now. Yeah, so you won scholarships. Look at that. Yes. Kind of scholarships. Tell us how much, I'd love to know how much you got in scholarships, and how do you get scholarships? Because I think a lot of people are so freaked out by the cost of college, and they're so scared. So, tell me. Um, do you want to know the scholarships I had, like, total overall, or just for University of Florida? Let's just go through it. Just, like, if you can rattle them off, that'd be great. Uh, okay, so overall, with all the collective like schools I was going to, it was like in the millions. Um, oh, like all the schools you applied of the yeah, scholarships all, they gave everything you. accumulated. But then for oh. just for um, University of Florida, it was I have about twenty eight thousand dollars of scholarships. Um, I have multiple golf scholarships, um, like with female golfers. Um, I have scholarships from different churches within my community. A lot of scholarships were within my community, and that's something mm. people kind of miss out. Like, even though, like, Nationals, like, super great, like, go get, go get them. Um, I got, like, a Foot Locker scholarship, and that was awesome, great. How'd you get that? Do you apply? Yes, just apply. I was, I literally looked up, like, every brand. I was like, Nike scholarships, Foot Locker scholarships. Um, so I, I needed money. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Um, 
How long does it take you? How long does it take you to apply? Like you go and you look it up, Foot Locker. Mm -hmm. um, so tell me, like, is it an hour to apply? Do you just take the same essay? Is it like? And then how much do they give you? My strategy was having at least three scholarships yeah. um, on total, and then just like recycling through, like copy and pasting um, this certain material. Because like once you have like those three strong like scholarship essays, um, you can like mix them around to whatever you need, add a little details. Like, and that's why I need your money, um, yeah. <laughs> just to be blunt and honest. Um, okay. And for Foot Locker, that was like a thousand. Um, but then for like locals, um, like banks. Um, other schools they were giving give the like, banks a plug let's give those local people some yeah. some let's just you know tell me um for me i got the community first bank um i think it's like five thousand dollars a year so that's amazing yeah. love community first uh, <laughs> yes. I don't love community first but you know that's great they gave me five thousand bucks yes and then and when you apply for that so you did you have to interview for that one I did. There were a lot of, a good number of scholarships that I had to interview for. Tell me more about the local. You're so generous to offer that. This is great. Um, were there more, more local ones, church ones, you said? Um, I have a list. Do you want me to whip that out? Let's do fast? that. You know what? Let's, you know what? In the description, what we can do is okay. we could include this if you're comfortable and yes. we can share this because just the idea that there are these local scholarships mm -hmm. and all you have to do is ask. And it sounds like also you're golfing. Like you're a Division One golfer, right? Like I'm on the golf club team. I'm. Oh, so you're. I'm the, not like, ooh, that's oh, a, that's great to know. So <laughs> that you could be on the club, but you're on the club team, and you still get golf scholarships, hmm. right? And you applied, so you're relentless. You're good at taking risks, and you're also good at rejection because you didn't get a lot too, right? Yeah, I got a lot of. Thank you for applying. <laughs> a lot of that. Yeah. And then you'll get money. Will you get those next year? Are those reoccurring scholarships? Um, at least I would say about like 10 or 11 of those would be reoccurring. And then are you going to apply? Have you applied again for this next round? Apply this again, round? yes, sir. And are you getting answers back? Yes, I have so far um, four responses. So we'll, um, yes. We'll nice. You're getting more money. Yes. Yay. Exciting. <laughs> wow. We could talk more about that. Like, if, if anyone watching this wants to know more about the money piece and the scholarship piece, maybe I'll bring you back to do like a scholarship before college TV talk, just cause you know, it's like, it's so confusing, right? Did you use a book? Is there a book you used? I did use a book actually. Yes. Which book? Um, it was, I think it was Princeton review, like scholarship 2019, 2020. And it was just like a list. Of, it's like this big guys. Um, just a list of like everything, like, if you're like gender or race or like major anything everything it is in there, nice. is in there. did you use a website too i i did use a website i, I used like unigo um but like those scholarships i didn't it, it was iffy it was iffy with those okay. but the local is the key and i know through libraries sometimes the libraries will show you a list of the scholarships that are available to your community now well, that's exciting all right Daniel, thank you for being so patient. How did you decide UF? Let me know what that experience was applying. Um, I'm really curious. And, and where else did you apply and where did you get in and not get in? Uh, just being full, blunt and honest, UF was not my first choice. Um, it was also not my dream school. I was for sure certain since high school that I was getting out of Florida. I was going to create this perfect life in New York City. Um, and I, I did get accepted into NYU, but I, which was honestly, it was, it was fighting for number one between NYU and Georgetown. Okay. Um, but I ended up not going. And the reason I ended up not going was money. Um, okay. UF gave me a full ride scholarship and, wow. uh, and at NYU, they gave me, like fifty, fifty-four thousand dollars a year, right. um, which I know sounds like a lot of money, but it costs like seventy, seventy-eight. So, right. So you would have had about eighty thousand dollars in loans if that was the path you chose. Yeah, and I knew that I could probably apply to more scholarships um, while I was there, but I think that there were just so many other things that got in that got into that. I mean. And, and, and for me, NYU was the first acceptance letter that I got. Yeah. And I had actually applied because when you apply to NYU, I think I applied 
I don't remember if it was Common App or Coalition. I remember I had okay. to use both because not all universities um, fell into one. Okay. But you can apply to their worldwide campuses. So you can apply to their campus in London and Paris and Abu Dhabi and Shanghai. And I remember I applied to every campus. I was like, <laughs> I, 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 I want to go. I've, I've always been a person that's loved to travel. Um, wow. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to travel a lot. But I wanted to study abroad. And that was, that was a really big goal of mine going into college. Yeah. Um, getting an educational experience abroad and and why you gave me that and told me that I was going to spend my first year in London and turning that down was one of the biggest decisions I've made in my life to this day um, and genuinely I don't regret it I regretted it for a very long time um, during I got accepted to UF for summer B which is uh, okay. six weeks before fall yeah so I um I regretted it during that whole time. I was like, this is not the place for me. Like I could be in London right now, living my best life, um, getting a solid liberal arts education. Instead, I'm at the University of Florida, but I met amazing people. I got involved in amazing organizations. I really became to love um, the place that I ended up choosing. Um, even though the reason that I did choose it initially was for the scholarship, was money reasons. I think that now the reason I love UF goes way beyond that um and yeah i i didn't get rejected from any school i applied to but i also did not apply to many schools because i knew exactly where i wanted to go and my thought process was kind of like well if nyu doesn't want me and uf doesn't want me then i guess i'm just dumb and i maybe shouldn't go to college <laughs> um so i i had applied to nyu i applied to georgetown uh, i applied to uf and my like backup, backup, backup school was FIU in Miami. Yeah. Um, and I actually pulled my application out for Georgetown. I had like an interview that week, but as soon as I got my acceptance to NYU, I was like, I'm not even gonna continue this application process. Like, it doesn't even matter at this point. I got into NYU, I'm like set. And then, so like, that was so you got in, but then you didn't know what the financial aid package was going to be. So what is it? you got into NYU, but you didn't realize till later that the financial piece was going to be an obstacle. Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. So it was actually the same for NYU and, and UF. Um, I got the acceptance to NYU exactly a week before I got the one to UF. Um, and I honestly, I didn't think I was going to get into NYU. I was like, ah, I'm shooting my shot here, but I, I don't think I'm going to get in. Um, I was a little bit more certain that I would get into UF, but I'm I'm a very anxious person, so I feel like nothing is gonna like it's not gonna go the right way. Right. Um, so I got accepted, but then I actually didn't make a decision till both schools then sent me my financial aid package, which came I think like three weeks after my acceptance. Okay. Yeah. Right. So I wanna make sure that people who are watching recognize, you know, you should apply um to these schools. You know, I even wonder and you know what you're doing now, and I want to share what you currently do at UF, because for someone who didn't want to go here, you are such an exceptional leader. As a student who is starting his second year, I mean, you are extraordinary. And I know that you are going to build so many incredible, meaningful relationships and have already started doing that. And you could go to any grad school you want. You know, you're going to be able to go anywhere and do anything because nothing stops you and you're going to do it on your terms, which is incredibly exciting. You are uh, involved at UF First Generation Leadership Program, uh, Bob Graham's Fellows. You're the Treasurer, First Generation Affairs Student Government Executive Branch, Academic Director, Hispanic Student Association, American Enterprise Institute, Florida Blue Key, Keystone Division, Gators, for Israel, Alexander Hamilton Society, past campus involvement. You're also past campus involvement. How could you even have past campus involvement, man? You like, right, you just, you just haven't stopped. Uh, it's remarkable, even Chomp the Vote, Executive Agency, Gator Party, Florida Lat Latinx, Hispanic American Student Union. So, I mean, wow, is that all true, dude? Uh, yeah, my um, the the reason why I have past involvement is because that those were the things that I did freshman year, um, and then my current involvement, which is what you listed first, 
um, were kind of things that I got. I, I was already involved in Bob Graham Student Fellows. Yeah. You kind of had to be a member to then run for the executive board. So that I ran for the executive board as treasurer. Um, First Generation Affairs, I applied to that in April. Okay. SGOP, I founded. Yeah. So, so the, the, the involvement now are all things that I have gotten between the past three, four months. Yeah. Gotcha. And a lot of that has been during remote learning and during COVID, which is, yes. also, you know, a real testament that, that, that can't stop you. But here's the part that I was just going to visit, revisit is that for a student who wants to go to college, especially a first gen student who is uh, an underrepresented student or comes from a minority group, there are so many organizations and so much money. Like, I wonder if you had applied for Georgetown or even some of these, if you didn't pull your application, Georgetown might have looked at you and said, dude, we're going to give you a full ride too. Like, did that occur to you at all? I think in the moment it didn't um, because, well, first, the, the application for Georgetown was unlike anything. I know, you know, Gabby mentioned how tedious it was and, 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 applications for like NYU and UF were very tedious um, just because like the essays were very similar but for Georgetown I had to write like five essays it was like a specific to your to your college specific to your major specific why you want to go to Georgetown and it was all these it, it, it was extremely overwhelming for someone who yeah. was going through this process alone without really the help from yeah. anyone um, and I was able to get an interview so because because you also have to interview to get in right. so I was able to get the interview but I was I think in the back of my mind I was certain that at NYU they were going to give me a full ride because of my financial status because right. I did come from a low-income background which is exactly the reason why I was able to get a full ride scholarship to UF was because yep. of my financial status so I kind of figured that would be the same for NYU, um, but then it wasn't. And um, I mean, I can't look back at my life with regret. I can only look forward with opportunity. Yeah. So, well, yeah. I look at, and, and it's a sensitive question because it then you know, makes you have to think, oh, you know, do I regret that or could I have done that? But like you're doing, like you're amazing. This is where you're supposed to be and you're unbelievably exceptional. And I think that, when students are watching this, especially first-gen students who come from low-income families, when you're applying uh, the public school versus the private school, you know, what type of money are they giving? What type of money is available for scholarships? But Georgetown's also a private school. But those are things that come into play. And if anybody's watching this and has questions about that, you can reach out to any of our panelists, certainly reach out to me as well. Uh, because what I've learned is, is not having a lot of money ends up being an incredible asset. It's amazing how many people want to help and how supported you are. And sure, certainly you've, you've been learning that, um, but this is why I like doing this type of, of, of interview. All right, man, you are all so interesting. Uh, I only got through like two questions so far uh, and there's so, there's so many more. All right, so I want to know, let's go to you, Gabby, okay? So Gabby, you get on campus, you're living on campus, right? And you need to make friends. Uh, how did you make your first couple of friends on campus? Definitely, I will give it to, it's this place called La Salita and it's in the, right, the Rights Union. And it's this, I'm gonna try to explain it the best, to the best of my ability. It's a corridor of different communities and it's just different rooms. It's Hispanic, the black community, um, LGBTQ plus community, Asian community, and the list goes on and student government is right above it. So, you know, just going back and forth from there and getting involved um, and meeting people in there, and not even just from my own community, but the Asians, the black community, LGBT, and it was just, it's just that that corridor holds so many memories, so many good memories, and I talk too much, so that also helped. Oh, that's great. So you, what do you do? You go there and you just walk walk through the hall, and you're like, "I'm Gabby," or like, "What do you?" Or do you like like how do you make that first move? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so you, you just walk through and you go, "I'm Gabby." And then, that's basically no, but usually like I made friends with Bianca, which was the 
veter- the um, Hispanic Veteran Affairs, um, I guess you could say like chair. Yeah. And she would, she would, her office was in Salita. So uh-huh. when she would need other, other things from other, like the communities, she would send me over there. So then I would talk to people, get in the conversation. And you didn't even have to be like, you know, have like errands to run or anything like that. You can literally walk in and just be accepted. I remember they were holding this kind of conversational meeting in the LGBTQ plus like room that they have. Yeah. And I sat in there and everyone was so welcoming, so nice. And I guarantee you anywhere that you go in that little corridor, open arms. No questions asked. Um, So when you walk into that room, are you nervous that people don't know you? Are you nervous people are going to judge you? Um, You know, especially walking into even even that particular room um you know and i don't know much about you and i want to really respect your boundaries you know whether you're an ally or you identify as as lgbtq but walking in that room you know how do you do that and and be brave and know Um, know that you can do that well i've always been um extroverted so it was never really a problem for me but also in the back of my mind you never know who's going to accept you who's not going to accept you um I keep going back to the LGBT room because it's it my really good memories come from there and I didn't even realize it so you know I left you know seeing that there's just there were just so many opportunities there and and a lot of things and and I know that they both can agree with me when I say this a lot of opportunities come from networking and that's why I take so much pride and so much comfort in talking to everybody because you never know till you try it right. Right. You never know, so you try. Right. And was that your plan that you were going to go to? Tell me the name of the corridor again. Um, well, it's in the second floor of the Rights Union. Um, and it's like this really big building. They have like a food court and stuff like that. Yeah. Usually it's the bookstore. A lot of people know that, that like they go on that. The um, Cicerones. I'm so sorry. Cicerones. When Cicerones does the tour, they take them to the bookstore. The bookstore is in the Rights Union. But in the rights union, there's so many different places you can go. So many different places. But in the second floor, right when you get up the staircase, right in front of you, there's that corridor. It's Hispanic Latin, um, Hispanic Latinx Affairs, um, Black Student Union, Asians, and then the LGBT. That's the exact order. I'm like trying to do right. the of in my brain. But even if you're not a, a part of any community, walk in. Right, you, can be, you don't have to be any of these things. Yeah. And you are nodding you vigorously. You can be an ally. You can just walk in because you're bored. And they accept everybody. We've had, we've had people, Daniel can back me up. We've had random people walk in and we'll start talking to them. We'll sit them down. We'll start talking. They can do homework with us. It's a very welcoming environment. And that's exactly why I wanted to go to UF. That's exactly, yeah. precisely why I wanted to go. Right. And there are a lot of students at UF. So... The idea that you can find community and connection and do that really quickly is, uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful. It's exciting for people to know. Mambo, how did you find your first couple friends at UF? Um, it was during summer B. I was um, put inside um, the Promise program. Um, and so like basically it was um, a mixture of like first generation kids, um, people, literally just kids from like everywhere. And it was, it was just to give us like a little bit more support um, for college. Um, and so I was able to really connect with some people because like we were very similar. We're like, oh, summer B and like, oh, your parents do this. My parents kind of do that. Um, and so that was like an instant connection. But um, I also want to say that I did cry because I was like, there's no way on earth I could make any friends, which is funny because I'm a great person. Um, <laughs> but like, um, it was just like, I was really struggling because I was like, I want to make sure that like, I'm coming to the school, like, of course, for my education, but I like, I wanted to like a really good support system. Um, and then when fall came, I was able to really find that with all the, all the organizations because the org- organizations were like closed in the summer. So when come fall, like everything opens up and then you're meeting so many more new people. Um, I was able to connect more with the people that I met and yeah. I've been incredibly grateful and we've been talking literally all quarantine. So like, I'm very grateful to like, wow, like at least now I can have some place that I can like really call like my own home, my own family. So the organizations really became your home, but before that you were a little lonely and scared. Yeah, of course. Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, we'll learn more about that. I want to know more. Daniel, uh, how did you find your first few friends at UF? 
I think that I didn't find them. I think they found me. Um, <laughs> I was, I'm, I'm kind of like Gabby. I'm, I'm, I'm very extroverted. I, um, in a sense, very confident in who I am um, and not caring much of what other people think about me. I, I, I just kind of need to walk into a room confident. Um, but I remember during preview, I, I preview is the, the freshman orientation. I, I think I underestimated how big UF was. Um, and how very unlike, um, I don't know, the 1,800 students in my high school, and this was 60,000 students now. Um, and the very first person who came up to me, because I was also in the Promise program um, with Mambo. What's the Promise program? Yeah, so the Promise program is for, I believe, first-generation minority students. So then you get accepted in Summer B, and you get like a mentor, um, it's kind of like extra help for students who are first generation, who are also my, uh, minorities. Um, what's summer B? Summer B is the second summer, sem- the mm, second or third, I guess, okay. summer semester. So summer A is the first six weeks. Summer B is the second six weeks of summer. And then summer C is summer A and summer B together. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. So then we started summer B taking like six, seven credits kind of. So it was, it was kind of like an easier transition than stepping straight into fall and taking like 15 credits. Okay. Um, and summer B was also very fun. Um, I do have to admit, um, it was definitely an introduction to UF life and UF culture outside of organizations, just, you know, like hanging out with friends and, and going to parties or whatever that may be. It was, Definitely a culture and a life that I was not used to um, because in high school, I was always that kid that um, like I never I never really like went to parties like I hung out with friends and stuff but like parties were never my thing like that type of environment wasn't my thing and it was definitely it was definitely a new environment um, to say the least at, at UF during summer B. Um, it's fun. But, um, People hang out, have a good time. Yes. <laughs> um, no, but I think that, you know, my, my transition into college starting in summer B made my transition in fall a lot easier. And the way I was able to meet friends was, you know, during preview, this girl named Christina, who was also on the Promise program, came up to me and, and we became friends. And then she had met this other girl named Julie. And then we kind of became the trio in the summer where we like always hung out and we were always the ones that were always together. And then slowly through that, you know, since everyone in Promise lived in the same, um, kind of the same community, the same building, yeah. um, people would hang out in the a little patio area. And one day I remember I just went out there at night and I just started talking to people. Like I just walked out there and I was like, hey, what's your name? What's your major? How are you? Where are you from? Um, and I met a big group of people. And then in the fall that only expanded even more when I got involved with HSA, which was the very first organization I got involved with. HSA is the Hispanic Student Association, right? And they're very welcoming in that same in the same union. One of the doors, yeah. they're one of the yeah. Doors. So that's actually yeah. um, what Gabby was talking about with La Salita was La Salita basically translates to the living room, I guess. Okay. But it was like La Salita, um, and it was like a kind of like a designated like safe space for people that are Hispanic or that are Latinx. Um, so you can always hang out in there and you knew you were always going to find people that related to you in some sense or another. And at the same time, you have that corridor um, of other communities. Cause I think a really important part about college is also, you know, getting exposed to different things because I've, I'm used to being Cuban and being around my Cuban family all the time. And you go to UF and it's so, so many people from diverse backgrounds. And it's honestly amazing meeting all of these people, getting new perspectives really. Yeah. And you have to be open to it. It sounds like you were by just walking around and saying hi. So for you and Gabby, you know, finally just walking around and saying hi, and then Mambo, you as well, but the the organizations. um, For students who are dealing with COVID, who can't go to Summer B, because I would imagine Summer B, is Summer B happening? Do you know? Yeah, Um, well, online, like virtually. So, so it's you can take virtually. classes, but not not um, not at the physical university. Yeah. So a message to those students who didn't get to experience some of the things that you're talking about that were so instrumental in helping your transition. How do you suggest they go about navigating this change during this really unusual year to find what you found? 
I mean, it's it's going to be a little bit different just because my I, I, I can only speak so far as to where my experiences have taken me. Um, and my experience was an in-person experience where we could go out in the patio and shake someone's hand and that would be something normal. Um, but that's that's not normal anymore. That's not like we have to create a new normal. And, and that is in the process of what we're in right now. But it's up to people like us. It's up to those new freshmen entering to create that new normal. Um, but I think a really big part, and I can only speak, you know, on UF particularly, sure. but I know a really big part about getting involved and getting that sense of community is through Facebook. Everything, everything. Like I, I didn't, I didn't have a Facebook in high school because I was like, no, that's like for old, that's like for moms <laughs> and grandmas and like for old people, like this is too formal. I don't like it, but it's become like my Instagram or my Twitter in high school. Um, it is where you learn about events and and even though things aren't happening in person anymore, everything continues to go online. It's just about adapting. So um, for incoming freshmen, for example, there's the UF24 Facebook page. Um, I was in the UF23 page, and that's where you get to meet people. You get to even, some people even get their roommates through Facebook. Um, so really, 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 it's just Facebook and looking up, you know, UF or even going on the UF website, there's this yeah. website called Gator Connect that has all the organizations and you can even type in keywords um, like Hispanic and every, his, every organization registered with the name Hispanic is going to come up. Um, and I remember in the beginning, I emailed all these organizations until I realized that email was the worst way to communicate at the University of Florida and that you can only reach out through Facebook. But yeah, I mean, I mean, mainly, you know, through Facebook, through social media, and in the fall, students that will be living on campus are, you know, are going to have roommates. So they're going to be able to have some sense of what we were able to have in Summer B. It won't be the same. But I think that university leaders, like the people in this group chat, I mean, and in, in not this group chat, in the Zoom call, are adapting to that and we're kind of setting the stage so that they can have as good as an experience as the one we had. Yeah, I get that sense. So you're all available. If a student has a question or if they identify with something you said or want to be part of any of your organizations, you're open to them reaching out to you. That's correct. It's not weird. Yeah. It's not uncomfortable. It's like, you want, like, bring it on, you know, send yeah. me a note. Yeah. 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 Right. I want to help you. Because I can take <laughs> Yeah, I, I love it. So we're going to include all of the different organizations. And if there's more you want to include in this in the description, I'll make sure that you have this so that you have access to get this out to people because that piece of students really identifying what they want. And Daniel, you really did a, it sounds like you really did a great job of this last year. You know, you just looked and said, what do I want? And then you found the places and the people who are doing what you wanted. And then you reached out to them, which is amazing. I mean, that's like, I don't think that's one of the reasons you're a leader and you're all leaders is because when you want something, you reached out and what you found was a welcoming community and at a school, like a large public institution, um, it's just so important. I think a lot of first gen students are afraid to ask questions. Uh, Gabby, you mentioned this a little before, you know, you do it on your own. You are a strong independent woman who doesn't need to ask for help. I don't know if that's true or if I'm just like making up words, but like, that's just not your thing. Right? Am I, do I, is that right? I, I just, basically I raised myself so everything, like in, in the most not like, oh, I'm so sorry for her, like no, like, but seriously, like, I basically raised myself so I kind of was used to doing everything for myself and that's why everything kind of comes so easy. Yeah. In the sense that, I did want to add though, for anybody that's going to UF and you know, is like online and stuff like that, to not be afraid to reach out to anybody, ever. Do, do a Daniel. Pull the emails out, message some people, DMs, Twitter, I don't even know. Whatever you whatever you kids do these days, I'm still a kid, that doesn't matter. <laughs> but Facebook is such an amazing tool as well. So do not be afraid. Do yeah. do a Daniel, do a Mambo, do whatever you want. Do a Gabby. Right. You can do that too. Right. So you do it. Are you okay asking for help when you need it though, Gabby? That's a loaded question. All right, let's have uh, that. Okay. <laughs> it, it was very hard in the beginning. I will admit that. It was very hard, you know, kind of being like, can you help me with stuff? Um, I will give it to Daniel. 
for being one of those people that kind of broke my shell open. It's a lot easier now. It's still challenging because there's a lot of things that happen in your first year, regardless of how perfect it goes. It's going to be hard, but it is worth it at the end of the day. I, I do not mean to discourage anyone, but, you know, asking for help is one of the things that you need to learn in college as hard as it is. I had to learn the hard way. It's okay as hard as it is. As hard, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to stop saying it. as hard as it is, ask for help because at okay, the end so of the day, it's, it's going to help you in the long run. And not even that, just when you ask for help, people end up not even just trusting you, but you form a relationship and it's not even just good as a f source of networking, but now you have friends, now you have a good community apart from your own. Yeah, I love that. You opened the door a crack. You said it, it was hard for you. You learned the hard way. So I have to ask you, Gabby, uh, what was your most uncomfortable experience your first year and how did you get through it? And I, I imagine you can incorporate the hard way lesson into this answer. Um, I'm going to try to condense the story as much as possible. Uh, I got overly involved and I mean, way too involved. I am a person that likes to try everything all at the same time. And that's not what you're supposed to do. Um, I like, I just packed my plate with a lot of things and I do, I want to, I want this to be a disclaimer. I do appreciate the Women's Student Association with everything in my heart. And they offered me an opportunity. I was on their, their e-board. I was the programming co-chair and it was very tedious. It was, a, it was a lot of work. It was a lot of GBMs, a lot of, it was general body meeting. So that was like every time, you know, they would meet. Um, and it was just a lot of preparations and I worked part-time um, I was very involved. I was on Gator Party. Um, I was in member leadership, um, member leadership program. I was in Florida's Future Leadership Program, which is also under Blue Key, which was a lot. Um, I was also volunteering apart from that. I was just in a lot of things, and it was just a lot. And I am a person who likes to, you know, do a lot of things, be very, I, I guess you could say distracted in a sense, but it was... It was, it was a lot. I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be very frank with everybody. It was a lot. And I, my mental health deteriorated very, uh, very rapidly. It, it was downhill. And I had to get, I worked very hard for my, my position. Yeah. And I was very excited to get that position. And if there was, I, I'm going to just explain it because it's just, Whatever you're comfortable it's, sharing. It's, yeah, no, I'm, I'm very comfortable at this point. I'm very open to it. Um, I was walking back to my dorm, and I had a very eclectic dorm experience in the sense that I did not like it at all. Um, I was walking back to my dorm, and my mentor from, my Florida, from Florida's Futures, he was basically my best friend. Like, my best friend, mentor, every sense – and I was walking home, and it was 12 o'clock at night. I had just finished studying at the library after work, after having a full day of school, work, then studying. I was going to go home to shower and eat because I hadn't eaten all day. And I was walking back, and I remember just walking down this one pathway right in front of my dorm, and I'd start crying, like just crying because I was so stressed. And, you know, my home life wasn't perfect either. It was very stressful. Mm -hmm. And I started crying. I started crying. And I, I had so much on my plate. And I called Clay, which is my mentor. And I, and I explained to him everything. And he told me, he kind of broke me, broke down the little shell that I'm talking about. And I was like, you know, I support you in everything you do. But you need to take a step back and see all the things you have and see if it's really worth it. Is, is it contributing to you as a person, to your learning experiences? Is, is this going to bring you something in the future that you want? It, what, is this, what does this do for you as a total? And that, every time I apply to something, go to a meeting, anything, anything, I just replay that entire scenario in my head. 
And it just really shows you how different everybody's college experience could be because I guarantee you that may have happened to Mambo, that may have happened to Daniel, but it may not have happened. And I'm very open to talking about mental health and, you know, how you need to balance everything as, as best as you can because I do not. <laughs> I do not. And I'm a person that like, I'm, I'm going to say, I like, I'm a person that likes to go out. I love going out. I love socializing. I love meeting new people, which is also one of the things, um, how I met people. But my plate was dripping at the sides. Mm -hmm. And I actually, there's an analogy that was told to me by Clay. There's a cup. And every time you have a responsibility or something that bothers you, it's kind of like a, a little drop of water. Right. And my cup was overpouring. It was just, it was just on the floor. It was everywhere. So, you know, just a tip for everybody. I do want to stress that, you know, there's no shame in, you know, having to resign from something. And I know everyone was talking about, you guys were talking about rejection. It's okay to turn things down. It's okay to be on the other side of that rejection. It's okay to know your limits. It's especially okay to, you know, cater to your mental health and you know know what's good for you what's appropriate for you and how it's going to benefit you and i think that's just it, it it's just really important it's really important yeah. because from that entire experience i learned so many different things i learned how to value things i got us emotional support animals right next to me so that's why i keep looking like off, <laughs> off screen because it's right here your emotional support animal you want to see her oh my gosh i would love to yeah, she's kind of asleep. Oh <laughs> but God. it's it, emotional sports is not for everybody. Like, it's, it's she's not for everybody. But she is the sweetest thing. Uh -huh. um, it, it's a different approach for everybody. This is what it works for me because I had a dog. I had two dogs back home. Well, here. Um, and I wasn't used to having a, a pet at, at my, in my dorm. Right. I wasn't used to not having the emotional support of my parents, my animals, or anything like that. And none of my friends went to UF. So I was basically alone. I literally was alone, <laughs> except for my sister, but she was already packed with everything and stuff like that. So just do what caters to you. That's what I'm trying to say. Do what makes you comfortable. And how do I say this? Know your limits, but expand them as much as possible without harming yourself. Yeah. That's that was very long and I'm so sorry, but no, that was beautiful. It was great. Uh, I talk a lot about people, places, and patience. And one of the most challenging parts of being a student going to college is you don't have your people, you don't have your places. And when things get uncomfortable, it's very easy to be impatient and to break down. And what you just shared is just an example of someone who is so unbelievably strong and you've been so strong throughout your entire life taking care of yourself, really being independent, having Sylvia, uh, the, the, your teacher at school, who's like, you know, you light up every time you think of her and see her. I, I could tell this energy. But you're at this school of 60,000 people, and you are a go-getter, and you are overwhelmed, and you don't have your people, and you don't have your places. And that's hard. So yes. for you to share that is a beautiful it's a beautiful testament and it sounds like now you have your people right yeah that, that. <laughs> right you got some of them here which is yeah. which is wonderful and you have your places and you understand the places that give you joy and align with your spirit that are for you as opposed to places where other people are going to say oh gabby's doing this and this and this and this and it's so hard to say no when people want you i think it's it's, it's yeah. a very difficult i think it's one of the one of the things that plagues leaders is that you're so exceptional and, and everybody wants you and you're going to disappoint people when you say no. And it's, it's very hard that everyone wants you. It's that you want everything. Yeah. Right. And, and you're probably good at getting it too. Well, we face rejection too. We're not perfect. Right. Right. We're but still in our second year. We're still in the trial and error phases, you know, maybe phasing out, but yeah. I think you're good at working through it. I think that what differentiates you from a lot of other people is that you, you, you can handle it and keep moving forward. Um, 
but the support of other people is key. And I think especially with first gen students, and we mentioned this before, Daniel, of how can you provide support and how can you be the people who can provide a place so that when somebody's feeling those big feelings, they're supported. And I think that's just, you know, it's great. I, Gabby, I want to share everything with you now after you told me that. It's like, <laughs> Go I feel, for it. <laughs> I feel totally safe. And I think that that's, that's what it does when, when you share that. So um, thanks, thanks for that gift. Uh, yeah. Mambo, I'm curious, tell me about your most uncomfortable experience so far and how you got through it. Oh, my goodness. Most uncomfortable? Okay. Or you can share a couple, you know. He said, give me the whole list. Right, why not? Give me the whole bag. <laughs> yeah, here, here you go. Um, uh, so this time, it was June of last year, I got a scholarship um, to go to, it was a John Deere Power for Good scholarship. Um, and they, it was a golf scholarship as well. So they flew me out to Illinois. Um, and I was like one of three girls um, out of like 80 people who applied. And it was absolutely great experience. We were basically treated so well. Um, and we were the guests of honor. Um, there was a night where um, a lot of us from local business owners, um, CEOs, um, other golf professionals were coming in and just having a nice little celebration of like networking and things of that sort. Um, and I was like, you know, with my group, um, you know, mingling. And then I decided, oh, let me get some more food because it was really good. Um, and like, you know, just like refresh myself. Um, so as I was doing so, um, there was a man who came over to me and he was holding like his drink in his hand and he was like, hey, um, can you throw those away for me? Um, and even though that might not sound like that important, but like here I am a woman who's obviously not dressed in any manner, um, being a wait staff. Um, and yet he comes and I have like, you know, my name tag on, like, I'm obviously here to, I'm alongside you. Um, and I was just like, um, no, there's a trash can right there right beside me. I'm not anything. He was like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Blah, blah, blah. And then like, he went along his day. Um, mm -hmm. and then I just, I was just like face, like it could just kind of like hits me back in the face. Like, why did that happen to me? Like, why, why would that happen to me specifically? And um, yet again, um, it's because, um, you know, I am an African-American woman, um, African-American. And just like, I was kind of like, just faced with like a lot of emotion because I was like, I, I'm, I'm here as a guest of honor. I'm here, I won a scholarship. I have been able to meet with so many important people. And yet, yet again, um, I'm just, like slapped in the face with something that like a micro, little microaggression, but that still hurts. Um, and that was just something that was very uncomfortable for me. Um, just because, I mean, if you're like placed in my shoe, um, and I'm sure that you would also feel the same. And I was just like really heartbroken. Um, but then again, I called my mom <laughs> and she just like really opened my eyes to say like, once again, like, okay, so what, you know, you, at least, you know, like what you were there for, keep on doing what you're doing. Um, and I just took that to heart. Um, and that's just one example of when I was uncomfortable. Yeah. When you go back to campus, do you share that story? Do you have people who can support you so that you feel connected and validated? Yeah. Um, I actually share that story. Um, I had a class called um, What is a Good Life? And they had a little essay at the end of the class. Um, it was during Summer B. Um, and so I did a little podcast story of me just walking through that entire experience. Um, and then I won the essay contest, um, and that's another scholarship opportunity because I got money for it. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> but like, you got money um, for that incident. Yeah, but but then so many things like so something that like have like that caused me pain turned into great like something great because then um, I'm in the first two program, um, which is a golf program, and it, they were one of the people that give has given me so many scholarships, and I have great connections with them, and they were like, hey, I, we see your story, we want to like put this out there for like every single like donor, every single kid can like listen to. Um, and like they had like, me have like constantly, they just like putting out my voice and I'm just like, okay, even though like this is something painful for me, it can be something turning into something beautiful, you know? So like there will be times where you're gonna be in a place of like such great uncomfort and you're like, why is this happening to me? Or like, I don't deserve this. Um, but you can turn that pain into something useful and push yourself forward if you're willing to, if you're willing to. Yeah, that's, remarkable and uh thanks for sharing that it's Absolutely. It's, it's it's inspiring and i'll never know what that's like being um someone who's 
you know, a white male born into a place of privilege. I think that's, that's also really important. Um, we are talking a little bit, that idea of being born and being uh, put into a world where you're judged and rejected and, and people make assumptions before they even get to know you. And, and the pain of dealing with that, uh, I can't even imagine what that's like and to continue to achieve and to be so remarkable and to see it still happen. It's like, uh, you know, it, it, will it go away? And, 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 and it doesn't go away. But when you share that story, what it does is it helps me to understand being in that place and it helps other people. And um, it's just, it's so powerful. So um, especially given this time of just, we don't talk about this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I love talking about it because I learn and other people learn because um, you guys are you're just all such beautiful people who uh, are offering so much love and joy and light. Daniel, tell me about your most uncomfortable experience and how you got through it. As everyone was speaking, I was really trying to think of an experience where I genuinely felt uncomfortable. Um, and honestly, I could not think of one. Um, I think maybe because the way in which I maybe manifest me feeling uncomfortable um, is in a different way than how everyone else may do it. Um, but I think that kind of jumping off of what Gabby said about getting into UF, getting super involved, um, sometimes it gets too much. And similarly to Gabby, it did get too much for me. It was, I think, like mid-October, mid to end October. Everything was happening. It was midterms happening. It was um, student government elections happening. Um, it was just everything happening at once. I had never in my life studied for an exam before. These were just things that, like in high school, they just came naturally to me. And yeah. it was like, it was that difference from going from high school to college where you now have to truly figure out who you are, how you study, um, and all of those things. And, you know, I can speak about, I guess, a couple uncomfortable situations that I had, but just the one that really keeps coming to mind is just the one, you know, during midterm season, I remember like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a very extroverted, happy dude. Like I don't, I don't put much thought to my feelings. I kind of just push that aside and I'm like, I have bigger things to do. I have bigger things to accomplish. Um, and I never put myself or my mental health before anything. Um, and it got to a point where it was so overwhelming that I kind of just like not broke down crying, but I, I kind of just laid in my bed for hours, not doing anything, thinking like, what am I doing? Um, and I, and sometimes I would remember walking into meetings and, and just feeling uncomfortable because sometimes you just feel like you don't belong there and you're like, I'm here. How did I get here? Do I even belong here? Am I even contributing? And I think that's something that has always been in the back of my mind. Like, am I doing enough? Um, and I would just sometimes feel uncomfortable when I would walk into certain events or certain meetings and I would feel like I wasn't doing enough. And it got to a point where all of that boggled up in my head got to me. Um, and in a sense that really damages your self-esteem and that really makes you look back and say, well, maybe I'm not as confident as I am, as I think I am. Maybe I'm not the person I think I am. Um, and then <clears throat> as you're thinking through that, you're, you know, you're, you have to keep going through life. There's no stopping. There's no stopping at, in college. There's, you know, you can't say, oh, I'm going to po postpone my midterm till next week. And when I'm feeling better. Um, and, and it was an uncomfortable moment for me because I made myself vulnerable to myself and I had never done that before. So no one noticed that, I mean, Gabby wouldn't even be able to tell you that I was going through that, but I was. Um, and it was just that idea of you making yourself vulnerable to yourself before you make yourself vulnerable to other people is important. And, you know, just being tr truthful with yourself and accepting things as they are. And I was always that kid that never accepted things as they are. I was like, no, there's a bigger thing. There's a better thing. Um, 
And, you know, I never lose hope that there is bigger and better things, but you also shouldn't let that bog you down and keep you on this constant search for like, there's bigger things, there's better things, there's bigger things, there's better things, because then that just gets to you. And, you know, stopping and stepping back and admitting to myself, like, you're in a position that if you from three months ago was looking at, you would not be happy with yourself. Are you happy with what you're doing? And in a big sense, I mean, I was happy. I was happy that I was at UF. I was happy that I was getting involved, but I was also unhappy on that I was involved in things and contributing to something that I felt wasn't giving me anything. And I don't, and, and you, sometimes you only realize that when you're on your tipping point, when you, when you're on the tip of the iceberg and you're like, Oh my God, I really can't do this anymore. I haven't slept this whole week because I go from meeting to meeting to meeting after class. And then I have to study for hours because it's midterm season. So then just everything gets to you and it gets so overwhelming and admitting that to yourself, admitting to yourself, maybe I'm not as strong as I think I am. Maybe I'm not as confident as I think I am. Maybe I'm not, you know, this going on the grind, always on the search for something better kid that I thought I am. And, or, or just admitting to yourself that like constantly being that person is not healthy, is not healthy. And just admitting those things, making myself vulnerable to my own vulnerabilities um, was a really big step for me, was a really, really big step for me. So how did you get through that once you had that realization and were laying in bed for hours? You know, what changed? How were you able to find the balance and the... Um, yeah, I mean, what, what changed was that, what, essentially what was happening is that I was putting a lot of my involvement work before my academic work um because and and or it just got to the point where like right after classes i would have i don't know four hours worth of meetings that day or i had to go to this event i had to go to that event because not only am i involved in all these other things but i those things also have other requirements that you have to do like going to you know i was involved in hsa but it was also like i also wanted to go to events from bsu or i wanted to go to event from other communities just because you're kind of like once you get involved and you get extremely involved and you start, be, you start kind of forming as a student leader, the expectations for you at the University of Florida are extremely high, extremely high. And, and you, not only talking to us, but you can talk to anyone that's in, in what we call involvement culture and, and everyone can share similar experiences on how overwhelming it gets. Um, because you're constantly on this grind. Not only are you at a top seven public university and it's academically rigorous, but you also have all these other expectations. Like, you know, we're, we're going to do such and such event or we're, we're going to do such and such program or, you know, or if you're involved in like student government elections, it's like, oh, we have to do all these things to win the elections. And sometimes those meetings would be till 10 or 11 p.m. And then you'd have meetings after that. Um, and then by the time you started studying, you were like, it, can I even focus? Can I, do I even understand what I'm, what's, what, what I'm reading? So, so what I had to do, you, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there laying there like, what am I doing? I came to college with a purpose of doing this and this and this. But then I kind of just comforted myself because I was like, no one's here to comfort me. And I also wasn't going to talk to anyone about it because that's just not the person I was. I, I'm kind of like Gabby in that sense that I, I'm independent and I want to handle things myself. But then I did have to talk to people about it. And I did have to go to my friends and say, look, this and like friends that maybe had been through that before, friends that were sophomores or juniors that had been in my position before and asked them for advice. Say, what do you do? Because I'm lost and I don't know what to do. And I, I talked to so many people that night. I talked to like four or five friends and they were like, look, like you are this amazing person. No one's going to think of you less if you step back you're still going to be an amazing person. You're still going to be a student leader. You're still going to do everything that you love. Um, but I'm also not a person to give up. So I was like, there's no way that in the middle of my involvement in a certain organization, I'm going to just pull out. Um, so I continued being involved in the organizations, uh, but I just changed my mindset. I 
did my academic stuff first before I ever said I would be available for a meeting or I would be available to go to an event. I started putting me first. I started putting my mental health first. Sometimes, you know, just like Gabby, I would go the whole day. Like I would maybe like have coffee for breakfast because I was always a must. And then I wouldn't eat the rest of the day and I would feel horrible um, because I was always on that grind, go, go, chase after it. But sometimes, you know, chasing after your dreams is perfectly fine. But sometimes you need to step back and really realize and reanalyze, like, what are my dreams? What am I doing? Is this getting me to those dreams? Um, and a lot of the things weren't. And once, you know, winter break came that I came back to school, that's when it really, like, fully kicked in. And I was like, I am, you know, it was, it was a new semester. I felt like I could start fresh. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that's really what I did. I just started putting myself first. And I'd never done that before. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting, and it's, it's a really fascinating journey to witness because there are so many students who deal with this, and I think there are so many who are surprised to feel this, that imposter syndrome. The, is that something that, that you all felt at, at some point, that imposter mm-hmm. syndrome? Yes. Did you ever go through that? Not so much, but you know, Gabby and, and Daniel. I know a lot of first-gen students, it's, you know, am I worthy? Do I deserve to be here? And it sounds like that, that really something that resonated but this piece of just understanding how to balance and to pull a headline from it is that everybody needs to put themselves first and it's amazing to be part of an organization and important to be part of an organization but if you don't take care of yourself you're not going to be able to serve the organization and the people in it and i think that's a really difficult lesson for people to learn and both of you and all of you i don't know if mambo if you've dealt with being overwhelmed you were certainly enthusiastic and agreeing with uh, the conversation. Um, would you also agree with that? With putting yourself first is important? Uh, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And that lesson. So great, okay. So grades, I wanna just hit on grades real quickly. Um, it sounds like you were all so busy, I wonder if you were able to get the grades that you were used to getting. Uh, was that first semester <laughs> hard for you or was it easy? And fill me in, uh, Gabby, it looks like it wasn't so easy for you. College is very different from high school. I will say that. There's no babying. There's no tutor. There's no right there in the, in the corner. I'm trying not to say it in Spanish. There's no one there in the corner to, you know, baby you through the homework. There's no one there. I mean, of course, there's professors that are very willing to help you, but it's, you're in college. You're an adult. You're, in, you're independent. Obviously, there's going to be resources for you, but not everybody knows where they are. Uh huh. And did so it was you, very hard. So tell me about your grades. I want to know what your GPA was like. You were probably pretty exceptional in high school, I imagine, right? Uh yeah, I graduated with a three point nine, which was not my greatest, but I don't honestly remember what my GPA was during my first semester. Okay. But now it's a 3.7, which is good. Like, okay. it's good. But it's not where I want it to be. How about your worst grade first first year? You know, did you fail anything? It was a C. C. That's C. failing. Yeah. For That's you. failing for me. That's failing for us. Right. You don't get Cs. Yeah, we don't get Cs. <laughs> like, no, no, um, we don't get Cs. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like very I, – I want to say that the stigma of, you know, with, like – children of immigrants or immigrant or immigrant children period um we have this mindset that we are supposed to get straight a's or even you know kids with really rigorous parents we're supposed to get these grades every single time we're supposed to be like you know these like machines that just output grades every single time yeah and you know i think that with our parents obviously now i i will say mine are more understanding but we're people and things happen and you know with the hundred things that we have on our plate besides the fact that we don't have them at home grades aren't going to be what they think they'll be and what we think they'll be because college is way harder not to mention we're at a top seven public university it's going to be hard it's going to be tedious it's going to be difficult right you're going to fail some stuff daniel did you fail any quizzes uh exams no, so I I never failed anything. Um, my lowest grade, sadly, was a B. Um, that's a final uh, grade. We're not talking. That's final. You didn't. 
There was a quiz. Yeah, that was my final grade, but I, I never failed any exams or quizzes or anything like sure. that. Wow. Um, but yeah, my lowest grade <laughs> was a B, and that to me was, I was like, wow, I might as well consider myself dumb and stupid because I just got a B, and I had never gotten a B before. <laughs> I was used to, I don't know, being the perfect straight A kid. And I was terrified, terrified to tell my parents. And surprisingly, when I did tell them, they were so comforting. I was like, wow, I wish I had that in high school. Um, but yeah, they were, they were just, you know, I kind of called them and they knew I was sad. They knew I was mad. And they were just like, look, we understand that, that you're in college. We understand that it's going to be hard. You know, we're, it's not like we're going to, ask you to be like this machine and pump out A's like nothing um, because it is, a, it is a different environment. So they were very understanding then, at least way more than they would have ever been in high school. But I think I'm my own biggest bully. So that affected me yeah. way more than I think it affects other kids, um, other students. But yeah, it, it, it affected me a lot. I, I to say it, Honestly, I, I felt like a failure. I, I was like, how can I get a B? Like, how is that even possible? Do you still feel that way? In a sense, no. But I feel like a lot of that experience from my first semester, I mean, I, mean, I don't regret my first semester. Um, as I said, I don't, I don't like to regret things that have happened in the past. But I knew that if maybe I wasn't as involved and I maybe didn't have all these other things, all these other drops in the cup, as Gabby was saying, um, I could have done better. I yeah. could have. Um, but it's just finding that balance. It took me that first semester to really hit me and tell me, hey, you need to study for exams. This is not high school anymore. Right. You need to do your readings. I never really read anything in high school. Everything just came naturally to me. Nor did I go to a high school that was rigorous. I, you know, some students go to you know, IB and that they enter UF and they're like, oh, this is easy. This is minimal work. But I didn't go to an IB high school. I didn't go to a rigorous high school. So that transition from high school to college really was a shock. And it, it, it was honestly just a learning experience. Yeah. Mambo, how about you? Academics. Um, academics. So first year, um, well, when he was, um, with, as Danny was saying, like, um, he didn't go to, like, um, um, a so-called rigorous high school. I went to a magnet school, so it was dedicated to, like, pushing their students. Um, so it was Darnell Cookman. It was a medical magnet. And so coming into college, it was at least a little bit easier for me um, to just kind of, like, fit into, like, the mold. Um, however, um, I did see a good number of Fs, a good number of Ds on my quizzes and some test scores. And I was like, great, um, especially like in mathematics. I was like, ooh, I was struggling. And I'm also like pre-med, so can't have that happen. Um, so going to office hours really um, helped me just being able to like really learn from like the teacher, like why they're teaching this material um, just kind of like helped it click for me. Um, so my lowest grade, um, at least on my transcript, is an A minus. However, I did get a B, but I pass failed it. So it says S instead of, um, you know, a B. And pass fail for people that don't know, I mean, simply that you just, um, I believe you like get the credit, but they just don't see your grades. Um, so it says like you took this class, and now you, we, they know that you know the material, but they don't know like the exact extent. Like, is it A? Is it a B? Um, so, it's, but I got a B. You um, passed failed the B. I passed failed the B. Yeah, like that is so. I was such not a good student. Like that. <laughs> like if I got a B, I'm keeping that one. I'm banking the B. <laughs> and I'm putting that in and locking it up. <laughs> but. Uh, so you were able to get through it through office hours and were there free tutoring? Was there, you know, were there ways, did you take advantage of any of those programs? Um, I did go to, UF has a, um, a good number of like teaching, I think it's a teaching center. Um, it's just where it's like tutors specifically that took like those courses or like they were once TAs for like, you know, especially like chemistries, the calculuses, um, pre-algebra, so on and so forth. They like, that's a resource that I went out to, um, especially for biology. 
Um, and it was very helpful. It gave you like a lot of like resources and worksheets to like really just constantly remind you. Cause I think something that's very important, at least back in high school, I just focused so much on like what it was, like what is the material so I can get this answer and like forget it for like, the rest of my life. Um, because that's just how it works. Right. Um, <laughs> but um, in college professors really stressed like why this is important and how is this important? Um, and that's something that like was difficult for me at first to kind of like, situate myself into but over time i was able to nice um that's wonderful uh daniel i just want to hit one thing because i've got two more questions for for everybody on the panel um the idea that you are not perfect and that you got your b and that b felt so wrong um you know just as someone who i just like talking to you i just think you're just such a warm person and such a smart person that um you know it's just part of it. You know, the, the, the beauty of getting a B, it, it has nothing to do with you and your value. Um, just to do with all those other things and the experience that you had and the realization that it was too much and, and coming to where you are and sharing the story so that other people can acknowledge that is, is such a great gift. Um, and it's such a, a wonderful part of that journey. But the idea of, get, of, of all of you just giving yourselves permission to be imperfect and to embrace who you are, I think it's a really hard thing from what I've seen from talking to first gen students and, and students who grew up in immigrant families is you know, there's so much riding on what you're doing. And when you fail, you're not just failing yourself, you're failing your parents, you know, you're failing your culture, you're failing all these other people who have sacrificed so much for you. So the weight of that is not just something that you hold on to as you, it's something so much bigger. And also I love Daniel, when you said that your parents, you know, they, love you and embraced you and see that you're working so hard. And then Gabby, you somehow figured out how to write the ship. You know, it's amazing that you did, you know, you, you like, you, you got it together. Like, how did you do that? How did you go from like struggling in the classroom to then just, you know, figuring it out? I saw this kind of like inspirational video one time and it was super random, but it stayed with me. And the guy was talking about, I, I want to find it. And I, I might just email it to you. You can probably use it. But Yeah, let's share it as part of this. Yeah, I, I'll try to look for it. But he said, he was saying how he treated college like a nine-to-five job. Coincidentally, I work at 5, 5.30. So I would do nine-to-five. I would do all my academic work. And it took me a while to get used to. But I would go from nine-to-five just go to town on all of my work and I would get everything done. I would go to work or, you know, on any other day when I would be off, I would usually have meetings. I would go to the meetings, relax, do what I needed to do. And by the time I'm done with everything, I can either go home or go study as an ex, like as optional, as extra work. So at that point I already had that system, that routine that I had, and it worked for me. I got I got my, my A's and my B's back. So right. it's a little hard now because of the distractions and stuff. But back then, when we were in person and stuff like that, it was yeah. very helpful to yeah. have that mindset. That's cool. So you got the time management from peace. You figured that out. All right. So we're going to do speed round because I've kept you for so long. And um, you're so interesting. We might have to do a part two. But I want to do a quick speed round. And you can share as much or as little question I always get from high school students is what's a typical Tuesday night for you? What's a typical Saturday night for you? Each person, it could be a little bit different. <laughs> <laughs> but give me, give me a typical Tuesday and a typical Saturday. Who wants to take the Tuesday and who wants to take the Saturday? Gabby, you want to do Saturday? You like to go <laughs> sure. <laughs> or it could be, you can be Saturday. And, um, you know, whoever wants to do Tuesday, right? Who wants to do Tuesday. Tuesday, Mambo. Daniel, were you on? Okay, okay. <laughs> I think you. I think Daniel's both. I think you should cover them both. <laughs> oh, yeah. <definitely>. Yeah. <laughs> okay, who's going first? Okay. I'll do Tuesday because okay, so Tuesday I would wake up at six a.m. Um, <laughs> just because it takes me a while to get ready. Um, I would then um get ready. I would have my classes around eight, and I would have back to back classes. So like from eight to nine, and then I'll go to run over campus um then go from like nine to ten and then i'll have a break 
Um, then, you know, I would be done at least by one o'clock. And then at that, in that time, I would either, um, you know, take a chance to like go to the gym because um, that is very important. Work out. Freshman 15 is a thing, guys. Um, it's not a joke. Um, <laughs> I would then um, go back home, shower, and then head over to the Florida Sister Rooms because they have meetings on Tuesdays. Um, the GVNs would last at least for me from 3 to 6. So 6 o'clock, I would be done. Then I would head over to my Bible study, which would be from like 7 to 8. And then at 8 o'clock, I would find a way to munch on my dinner. Um, and then from 8 to 10, 11, I would be studying all night. And then I'll go to bed. Watch TikTok, then go to bed. Yeah. Go to bed. <laughs> right, and get yeah. up at 6. So you're getting like five hours sleep, maybe? Yeah, but it's okay. <laughs> it's fine. Okay, we're yeah. functional. <laughs> right. Okay, cool. So that's like Mumbo's typical Tuesday. Very interesting. Yeah, you're not sleeping until noon. You're up, you're out. Interesting. Gabby, tell me about Saturday. Typical Saturday night or Saturday day night. The whole thing. Well, Saturday, depending on what homework I had, I would do the homework like in the morning. I would wake up whatever I want because, which is usually early in the morning because I'm, I'm an early bird like that. But mm -hmm. I usually just do homework in the morning if I had um, and just chill. Just chill the entire day. I would either, you know, watch TikToks or like go see friends, you know, go like for a walk or um, I have a couple of friends that have dogs, so I would go and see the dogs before I got her. So I would do that. And then at, at night. Let's hear about yeah. the night. It's nighttime. What's happening? Gainesville is uh, very. Daniel, Dan, you got to unmute your thing because I have to hear you laugh. <laughs> Gainesville is very versed in nightlife, um, might I say. So it was I, I took advantage of that. Nightlife? I'm sorry? Who's, who's well versed in nightlife? Gainesville. I took advantage of that. I yeah. was that. <laughs> yeah. Let's let's hear about the night. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> I would go out and you know just have fun with yeah, my friends. Like, there's not there's certain things I can't divulge. <laughs> right, right. You have a choice. You, you can do anything. <laughs> so you have you you go out. You have an, you you have your evening, but you balance your time. Yeah. And, and, and you find that balance. When it comes to the choices, when it comes to people who don't want to party and don't want to go out, people who like to just stay in and watch a movie. Oh, or, yeah. Those is, are the best. Is, is there that option, too? To like the Those are the best. I used to have Disney marathons with my roommates on, like, nights that I wouldn't want to go out, and it was the best thing because we had, like, a projector. Not everybody has a projector, but, yeah. we, like, these little projectors. And, like, even if there's so many people in have that don't want to go out, and there's sometimes where I didn't want to go out. I was too tired or whatever. And there, you'd be surprised how many people just, like, want to go to dinner or want to go to the movies or, you know, like, just want to hang out in the common room and, like, play, like, um, what's that? I don't know. They have a friend. Foosball. Foosball. You know, Foosball. Yeah. And it's just very innocent little things. They want to, like, recap The Bachelorette or whatever. Very common. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> There's right. so many different things you could do in Gainesville that you shouldn't limit yourself to just going out. Nice. Okay. So you got all those options. Great. Um, I've got two, two questions, and then, then we're all done. Uh, your dream job. I would love to know your dream job, if any of you have a dream job. Ooh. <laughs> Fire away. You don't have to go first since we talked first time. Okay, yeah. Um, I can go first. Oh, my God. I have a lot of dream jobs. <laughs> I... I don't see myself doing one thing for the rest of my life. I think that is so boring. Um, and thank God that I am studying what I'm studying that, gives, that opens up so many possibilities for me. Um, but my dream, dream, like this has been my goal for so long is to work at the United Nations. Oh, cool. To be, a, yeah, to be the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. Nice. Okay. Do you know anyone who works in the, in the U.N.? Um, I don't know anyone, but I do have friends that have done the UN internship. Um, so that's something I'm really interested in. Um, I'm also really interested in working for the Department of State, being a diplomat or an ambassador to the Middle East or Europe. Um, I'm, my, my grad school plan is to go to law school. That's always been my long-term plan. So I think that when I'm 
in my 50s and old and maybe I don't want to live in a new country every three years, then I will open up a law firm, do, I don't know, international law. Anything international is really my passion. Nice. Well, that's exciting. That's cool. Yeah. If there's anybody out there who's involved with any of these things, uh, I would get in touch with Daniel because <laughs> yes, you're going to be you're going to be doing these things. There's there's no question about it. All right, Gabby, dream job. I don't have one particular dream job. I will. I heavily agree with Daniel when I when I say that I do not want to do one thing for the rest of my life. I. It's a newfound thing. Like I know my major is business management and I have a minor in finance for anybody that doesn't know that, but I'm going to be frank with everyone. That's just because I'm good at math. It's just what I'm comfortable with. Um, but I want to be, I, I would love to be an advocate for whether it be mental health or, you know, common issues in politics such as, you know, can, can I say it? Say anything, yeah. You know, abortion, um, everything that's been going on with Black Lives Matter, and just a bunch of different problems that shouldn't be problems. I, I would love to be an educator and, you know, see that middle ground and educate everybody, maybe, you know, find that, that agreement between everything. Just be more of a people person. Um, I am very interested in the adoption and foster care system. So that's that. It's yeah. just, there's just a lot of different things that pique my Great. interest and I'm very interested in and I have been following for a very long time. Yeah. But they also, I mean, it sounds like you're, you're in a place where you can explore that. And I like when people share what they want. You know, it's like some people are going to want what you want and some aren't. But if we put it out in the world, then the people who are interested can reach out and connect, which I think is really cool. Um, I'm, just, I'm a big fan of, of putting stuff out in the universe. So I feel like the universe will give you wonderful things back, but unless we offer, uh, then we limit ourselves because it's hard to get it's hard to get it back if we don't put it out there. Dumbo, what about you? Um, I see myself, you know, in an awful little cottage out on the beach, just watching the waves. Um, that would be cool, though. Um, yeah. But for career wise, I would want to become an oncologist. That has been a very long goal of mine since I would say high school. I've always just been interested in medicine. Yeah. Um, but oncology came up during, like I said, in high school, and that was something I just kind of clicked with. Yeah. Um, so that's something I'm pursuing. Nice. Exciting. If you could all go back in time, this is the last question. You can go back in time and give high school you, freshman you, freshman in high school you, one bit of advice. Daniel, Gabby, Mambo, if you can tell yourself something that would eliminate a lot of anxiety, that would have helped you tremendously to navigate the experiences that you've had, what's one thing you would tell yourself to help you to get comfortable with the uncomfortable? Get a calendar. Simple. Get a calendar. <laughs> it's it. It's all it's, about the... The way I did my... And if you've seen my calendar, it's scary. It has social, meetings, work, everything. And my whole entire life is on that calendar. And if I had that in high school, my life would be 10 times easier. Perfect. Daniel. Yeah, this is what I say when I mean that Gabby and me live identical lives. Because um, <laughs> I was thinking the same thing. Um, just be, um, I'm, I'm a very organized person. I feel like on the outside, but I feel like on the inside, I'm everywhere and nowhere at once. <laughs> and I'm pulling myself in 30 different directions. Um, and I don't, I, I, I used to not write things down and not put things down in my calendar. But in college, Lord Jesus, that has been the best thing that I could have ever done. And I wish that I would have done that since high school um, and kind of just organized a path for myself. I knew where I wanted to go, but I didn't have a detailed, organized plan on how I was going to get there. I was like, yeah, I'm going to go to college and then I'll figure it out then. But I think that that and, you know, start studying for the SAT sooner. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the biggest <laughs> advice I have for freshman year me. Yeah. Yeah. Even if it's optional, though, because it might be optional. You know, yeah. Test, there's always test optional schools, so you can even skip it if you stink at, at tests. Bombo, what would you tell you? Um, I, I mean, I don't have that much to say because I believe I did almost everything. Yeah. But, but um, something yeah. I would really 
emphasize would be um, don't be afraid of taking opportunity, um, whether they fail or succeed, um, because you never know a door that leads down to you. Like, for example, I took like a little small class, like in um, the class, which is College of Liberal Arts and Science, um, about like building myself professionally. And somehow, because of the connections I was able to make, um, I was able to go to London over spring break. Right. Um, and then once again, like just like meeting up with like certain people, like just making myself like open, like just listening to other people, making sure they knew that I was like there. Um, I, I have a presence. Um, people would just like, you know, really open their doors to you and like say like, hey, we want you to like do this or like, hey, check out this. And that just leads to so on and so forth. So that would be something I would say, hey, mom, we'll like stick to that. Yeah, just being open. Well, you are all so generous. You have taken so much of your time to open up your lives. And I'm so grateful for this. And I know those who have watched this and listened, they really know you and get a handle on why you're where you are and your success. You're, you're all so wonderful. And I'm grateful to have this relationship with you. And one last reminder, if there's someone out there who wants to contact you, who has questions, are you open? Are you comfortable with people reaching out to you? So absolutely, right? This group really wants to help and support you. And I'm grateful that I can be here with you. And likewise, if there's anything I could do for any of you, any of the people I know, any of the relationships I have, I'm more than happy to introduce anybody to anyone and do everything I can to cheer you on so you can get where you want to go. For everybody watching, thanks so much for being here. I'm Harlan Cohn. This has been a college conversation with the University of Florida. Thanks so much. And uh, what else are I going to tell you? Yeah, keep watching and let me know other schools that you want me to highlight. Thanks for being here. Grateful to be in your corner and we'll continue the conversation. Thanks, everybody.